Hey there, I can't believe another week has come and gone. I'm here in the garage with this old 912 engine, and I gotta tell you, this is not the startup video. I tried to catch up from last week. If you'll notice, I only did the CC on one of the heads, and I ran into some problem installing the valve guides. The intakes went in a little harder than usual, but they went okay. The exhaust guide just got stuck in the bore, and I had a weird suspicion something wasn't right. I didn't want to break anything, so I stopped pressing it in. It was about halfway in, and I ended up drilling that guide out. So I don't have enough valve guides to complete the assembly of this engine, but I'm going to continue assembly and try to find out if there's any more parts I need, like gaskets or shims or something I might possibly need to order. So stay tuned. Garage time. Okay, the three main goals of today's video are to measure the ring gap and check the cylinder bores, to set up the compression ratio, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. We had some comments about compression ratio, and then set up the valve geometry and make sure that is correct and all working right. So if you haven't already subscribed, please do so now. You know, I provide these DIY tech videos for you to inspire you to get out in the garage and build something cool. This is a pretty ambitious project. Uh, my whole car has been pretty ambitious, but the engine in, in uh, specifically doing my own valve job and so forth has been a great project for me. And hopefully you guys are at least learning some of the process, even if you don't do that work at home. I think it's still helpful to understand the process. We have a Patreon page. I don't mention it all the time. Patreon is another community that is a way to support me. It's like either a dollar a month or $5 a month. And I have a little bit more behind the scenes stuff there. I also provide a free gift and we also provide uh, answers to your questions. If you have any particular questions or you wanna talk about your car, we all do that on, on Patreon. So if you'd like to support this channel, this build, please do so by visiting patreon.com, our garage time. Without that, it makes it hard to make these videos. So thank you again for your support and let's get into it. Here's the fragment of my valve guide that was destroyed as I removed it. But I was able to get it back out without causing any damage to the head. So hopefully next time I'll do some more research and get that to go in better. If you have any comments on lubrication that you would recommend, I've seen anything from lard to anti-seize to just regular old engine oil. This engine's been mocked up with no piston rings, so this cylinder was gonna come off. And these numbers don't correspond with the firing order for some reason. Here are the rings new in package, with instructions even. There's a date code on this. February 20th, 2009. So as I said, this engine was not rebuilt by me. I got the short block from a guy who didn't finish it. And these parts are supposedly new, but that's around the time I bought this kit from him. This engine cost me 1200 bucks. I'm pretty sure these are the NPR pistons and hopefully these are the correct rings. There's the oil rings. This is the number two ring and this is the top ring. These rings are cast iron as well as these cylinders are also cast iron. So the th trick to do here is to install these into the cylinders and check the end gap at both the top and the bottom of its travel. Start by making sure these are pretty clean. So always happens to me, I got my glove stuck in there. There we go. Let me plop the piston in there. Okay, that's about five or 10% down from the very, very top. So it's within its normal range of motion. So now we just measure with a feeler gauge and see how big that gap is. I got three feeler gauges in there, 24, 23, and 22. So that's 47. 67, 69, uh, that 
it's way too much. So these rings are probably not for the big board kit or they're for a totally different engine. I don't know, but this is not gonna work. Okay, I've just been shopping around and I have, I found another box of rings. These are Deve. And then I also have a bag of used rings. I don't know if they're any good, but I think these are for big bore. So let's see what we can cobble together. The ring gap should be between six and 14 thousandths. That's a pretty big range. And they're stuck. Wow, this is what I use for, to clean my paint gun. This has like a protective grease on there and it's really thick and kind of dried out. Much tighter gap, which is great. Okay, 13 is pretty tight. I think it's 13. That's definitely towards the higher end. I'm gonna measure its internal diameter because maybe these cylinders have been bored too big. I'm not sure. This isn't a digital micrometer, but it is a US share to Miko. I think it's US, yep. Minnesota. 3.3847. And then using the same tool, I'm gonna to measure the piston. Really just looking for the clearance here. Yeah, I just spent 30 minutes going through and measuring all the cylinders and all the pistons and re-matching them so the piston to cylinder clearance is ranging between 3.4 and 3.7. I got that on all four cylinders. That was a little diversion to try to make sure that the bores are correct. And three and a half thousandths is the target clearance. So the bores are okay. I've also installed the second ring to check its gap in each of these cylinders. And the second ring is the same, same gap, about 14 thousandths of an inch. And then you can see I did the whole stack on this one. This is the third compression ring. It has a gap too. This one's labeled top, but uh, this one has a gap of 12,000. So all the rings are within spec. They're on the large side of the gap, but that's all I can do. I can't adjust it. These pistons are offset. There's an arrow that goes towards the flywheel. So you gotta put them together that way. And I put this together without any base cylinder gaskets here. That was done on purpose. And what I'm after now, there's no rings installed just like before, but what I'm after now is this clearance between the piston and the head. So you can see there's a, a surface here that with the head contacts, that all gets compressed together with these bolts. And the piston stands proud of the cylinder. So what we're looking for is the clearance between the piston and the cylinder head. And that's referred to as the deck height. So I'm gonna be checking that. I'm also gonna be checking the parallelism between this barrel and this barrel, or basically the heights. So if you're new to engine building and some of these terms don't make sense to you, I know last week I threw out some compression ratio numbers. Okay, I'm gonna explain compression ratio uh, as simply as I can. It's a ratio of two volumes. One is the volume when the piston is all the way at bottom dead center. Think of the volume as the volume of the cylinder and the volume of the head. That is one volume, volume A. And then as the piston goes to top dead center, there's a whole new volume. Everything that was in volume A gets compressed into volume B. And that ratio is the compression ratio, just two volumes. It's pretty simple. Uh, it's the static compression ratio. You know, things get really complicated when things are moving and valves are slightly open at the bottom. They're fully closed at the top and there's overlap and there's dynamic induction, all sorts of momentum with airflow. And there's a lot of complexities that go into it. But when setting up an engine, all we care about is the mathematical compression ratio 
from the bottom of the stroke to the top of the stroke. Now, calculating those volumes can be a little difficult. Some things are easy, like we know the stroke of the engine, we know the bore of the engine. So that volume from top to bottom is pretty easy. We don't even have to measure it. We can look at the Porsche specs on that. But some other things, especially like with the heads, you know, I made some modifications to the heads to get the valves to fit. So that volume is important. I measured that last week. I got, I think, 63.4. And the volume of the piston relative to the cylinder is adjustable. And we adjust that with some base gaskets. Now, Porsche and Volkswagen are unique that way and where that deck height is somewhat adjustable. And you, it's possible you could have a different compression ratio on banks one and two versus banks three and four. So you gotta kinda do both sides. So we have to know the deck height, we have to know the piston dome volume, we have to know the head volume, and we have to know the bore and the stroke. Those are the big ones. The other thing is what should be the target compression ratio. Last week I threw out a number of 8.5 because I quickly looked at my head volume, which is only one piece of the equation, and I'm like, well, it's in the eight and a half ballpark. We're gonna nail it down 100% today, but the target with an older engine like this on today's fuels with you know, old technology, we have cast iron cylinders and we have cast aluminum pistons. The limit is about nine. That comes from Harry Pello. He's the maestro. Uh, Harry Pello died, I can't remember how many years ago. I've had a chance to have many conversations with him. I considered him a friend and we met up at several of the swap meets here in Southern California. And, you know, we would sit on the back of his tailgate with that gold-plated engine behind us, and we would just chat for, for hours, you know. Or I would throw technical stuff. I'm, I'm, my degree is in heat transfer, so we would talk about all sorts of stuff with related to axial heat flow in the cylinders versus wall thickness versus, you know, head temperature versus all sorts of stuff. And I would throw theory at him, and he would talk to me about the drives he does to Santa Cruz over that pass all the time and talk about real world examples. And uh, we, we really enjoyed you know, going back and forth at each, at each other because he was really an intellectual person, loved to talk about engines. He was um, certainly missed in the Porsche community, a big, a big asset. Um, his books are still around. I use Secrets of the Inner Circle to put this engine together double check all my work, make sure I don't forget anything. He tells you exactly when to put the cylinder deflectors in, when to check everything, how to put the pulleys on, all, all that stuff is in that book. It's really like the Bible for these engines. He recommends no more than nine to one. Harry loved these NPR cast pistons made in Japan. He used them in tons of engines, but they, um, they're, they're, it's, you just don't wanna push these to 9.5. That's potentially, possible, but it just reduces the life. They're, they're not, if you want to do 9.5, you should use the uh, aluminum cylinders with forged pistons. You know, that's not what this is. And my goal on this isn't to build a race engine. I'm just trying to get this car, you know, down the road, something to cruise around with. All the spacers now are in one side and these are just lightly torqued down. So the spacers actually contact the edge of the thick portion of the barrel, not the fins. So it is pushing the barrels down onto the block. And like I said, there's no copper shim at the moment. So I'm just looking at whether these two cylinder heights are equal. I switch it over here. A little daylight just right there. So let me get the feeler gauge and see what that is and see if it's within spec. Okay, I think it's about five or six thousandths. Let me try a longer straight edge too. It's a giant caliper. Seems like the high spot is right here on this cylinder. Just trying the same straight edge technique here on the, on the block. Looks really flat right here. I'm just doing a real quick spot check here on these cylinders. I mean, depending how you, it's, it's definitely a tough measurement. I get 3.980, which is about three and a half thousandths taller. 
So now perhaps I should look at the other cylinders and try to match the heights a little bit. I've already matched the pistons, but I can move the piston cylinder combo around and try to find something that's more equal height. Otherwise, I'm gonna to have to modify the height, which is kind of a hassle. Okay, I think I might have found a matching pair. 3.9755, 3.9755. Okay, I've done some swapping around and now I'm just going to retorque and try again. Putting pressure on the barrels so they'll seat as tightly as possible on the case. Oh, that's way better. Let me get the long daddy. Yeah, that I think is perfect. I don't think I can get a feeler gauge in there, but let me try. Yeah, it goes in on, um, on this side now, which is opposite. So I'm going to torque a little more on this one and see if it really influences the measurement. This now is the high spot. So just that little bit of torque prevented this from going in. So I think I've done the best I can do with this. It's within two thousandths of an inch, at least on this side. And it's only going to get better when I seat this down with more pressure. Okay, and this one looks off. So that problem might just be following, you know, one of these cylinders. So I have this side right here is slightly high. So now I got to take this all apart and determine why. I don't know if you noticed, this one cylinder was hard to get on and off. So I found out that one of the head studs was a little bit bent. So I'm replacing it with an extra one that I had and that might help it sit flatter. Not sure, but I'm trying that. This cylinder also has a broken fin and I did not do that torquing the um, bolts on this. This is how I found it. It probably, you know, like I said, got dinged. Probably when the head studs were bent, this cylinder probably got dinged. So I don't think it's gonna really affect anything. This is definitely a budget uh, engine build. This is not something that's going above and beyond. This is just making it run. These are pretty consistent from side to, from, from barrel to barrel, but from one side to the other, they're a little bit off. Unless it's just the way I'm holding this. They're pretty close. I don't know, if I was gonna remove material, I would, I would take a little bit off of here, but I don't know where I would take it off. So maybe I just need to switch them left and right until they have a flat surface across the head. No pistons this time. That definitely went on a lot easier, so that, that could have been part of the problem with at least the measurement. It's a little taller on this side and this side, but I, it's within the, it's within one and a half thousands. I'm not going to chase that out. That is close enough, especially given the way that these are torqued down. It's not torqued down ideal. So I'm still keeping the match between the piston and the barrel. Okay, top dead center is... Right there. 45 O. 49 O. So let me write these numbers down. The alternate way to do this is to put the head on. The technique on this one is to lay some uh, solder right here on the pistons. And then the solder is gonna get trapped between the piston and then these surfaces right here. We're not checking valve clearance here. I, I don't think I need to check the valve clearance because this is a stock cam and these pistons are known to work with stock cams. I 
I'm just using this cheap um, beam type torque wrench at the moment. I have a better one, but it's in storage. So I'm going to 15 using the recommended pattern crank with a bolt here on the end. I should be able to feel it right there. Now I'm just, now the bolt is spinning on the crank because it's not super tight. But yep, I just compressed the solder. I totally felt it. Ta-da! And there's the squished solder. That one made a pretty nice impression. This one here looks a little wacky, but let's, uh, let's take a look. Okay, it looks like to me the, the tightest clearance um, is in the angle portion. Okay, 41, thinnest spot on the left and on the right, 39.5. That's why we do it two methods. Um, I'm gonna take the lower of the two. I, I feel like in this case, it is a more complete measurement because it's taking measurements over a longer area. Okay, that number with the solder and the two ways I measured it is important really for two reasons. One, you never want your piston to be contacting the head. So a certain clearance for a street engine like one millimeter is a good range to start from. You, uh, you know, as things are spinning really fast, you have uh, the crankshaft is deflecting, the rod is stretching, the piston's expanding, you know, the case is flexing. You never want that clearance to be negative or contact because you're gonna create some serious damage and make some horrible noises. The other reason why we um, need that number is, remember I talked about all the volumes associated with the compression ratio. So now we know the volume between the top of the piston and the bottom of the cylinder. And that height relationship creates another volume. So let's see what we get with the numbers on a spreadsheet I have on my computer. The computer says 8.8 .8 if I use the 0.25 millimeter spacer. If I use no shims, then I get nine, 9.0. If you use no shims, then it's probably gonna leak. Uh, you're gonna get oil leaking out of there and I could possibly put some sealant on that and I usually put sealant on there anyways, even if I do put the copper gasket, but the likelihood of it leaking is pretty high. 8.8 .8 it is. Next up is going to be assembling that head that is complete. The other one's, you know, not complete. This head has been cleaned at least to kind of DIY standards. I don't believe in the bead blast or, you know, anything to do with sand on engine parts. It's uh, obviously sand and glass is not good for your engine. I think a lot of times shops will, will do that to save time. Uh, cleaning does take a ton of time. And what I used was just a bunch of uh, soap and water to get all the uh, valve cutting stuff out, all the debris from the valve cutting, also the guide cutting, and uh, lots of compressed air, high pressure water. And then I just used WD-40 and some white towels. And once the towels come clean, you're basically done. Okay, now that these heads are clean, the next thing to do is to install the springs and the springs should generate a certain pressure on the valve seat. The best thing to do would be to measure the actual spring pressure, or spring force, although that requires some special machinery. I mean, I have a load cell, but you have to measure the, the force and the distance at the same time. So it's, it's kind of a difficult process. Uh, I'm using stock springs, so it's a pretty well-known number. The second best thing to do is just to use the spring height. So the spring rate is known, the height at which it's installed will generate a certain force. And so that's the kind of method I'm gonna use. And I do have a factory spring measuring tool. Okay, this cute little plunger has two sets of lines on it with a line here on the plunger. So when it's at the installed height, it is it's perfect. If we Put this slug in the head here, keep that from falling down. And then you'd put this in here like, and then you put the retainer in. And then you can see that there's still a lot of 
a lot of travel left. So this plunger is nowhere near the right location. So for the lines to line up, it would be, it'd be right there. But the valve has like way too much travel still. So the, it's, it's just not right. It's the wrong, I think, height for this particular application. So this is just the wrong height. You can just use a six inch ruler there and, and get the number you need. Holding the valve all the way up and fully seated. And then just using this ruler here. Getting a good sight on it. This is up to like this a 10 thousandths of an inch accuracy on this. So it's 1.75 inches right now. I feel like this is just as accurate as the Porsche tool. I get 1.75 exactly. So now I need to compare that number with what the specified height is and then add those number of shims. Okay, I just checked the workshop manual for the installed height for the intake, 1.675, the exhaust is 1.635, and I got 1.750, so you just subtract those. Okay, I was able to find two shims, one thick, one thin, that equals 85 thousandths, so it's pretty close to 75. So we'll drop those in here. There's a little bit of aluminum marks on this one, so that's the way it was installed before. And then the uh, valve retainer, give it a little secondary clean. Kind of gave up on the gloves. This is, uh, Assembly lube mixed with Brad Penn oil, so it's kind of this green, green slime. Going in for the last time. Just like that, that's one done. You know, you don't have to like my valve spring compressor. It's, it's pretty cringy, I, I agree, but um, you don't have to like it, and, but you do have to subscribe. If you don't subscribe, then I'm gonna send you videos of valve springs shooting all over the place. I still wanna keep working on this head, get all the valves installed and get, keep going, but it's, it's getting late. Uh, I have a short week this week. Uh, family and I are going to the Central Coast to meet up with some other family. Fingers crossed, you know, next week, I hope to get the engine at least assembled. You know, I said that last week, but these things are time consuming and they're meticulous and they require a lot of problem solving. So ran into some things today that required more time as they do. Take care guys, see you next week. Mm -hmm.